It is a joy to be with you again. My name is Eric Skelton. My wife Jane is here with me this morning, along with our two boys, Paul and Mark, and our daughter Sarah is, is in Virginia today um, at a girls retreat. But um, it's been a couple years since we've been here with you. Um, the last time I was here at that time, we were serving with the Wisconsin Family Council. We had the joy of serving with the Wisconsin Family Council for uh, a little over five years throughout the state of Wisconsin. And uh, it was a joy. It was a real joy. But God called us away from that, moved us, uh, and now we're, um, we're out uh, uh, on a little chunk of property, three acres right on the edge of town in Monroe called God's Green Acres. We continue to serve marriages and individuals with pastoral counseling in addition to encourage people to eat healthy through God's Green Acres and uh, serve where the Lord takes us. I'm going to tell you a little bit later on about some gospel meetings we're going to be holding in Monroe shortly. I encourage you. I know it's a long ways away, but maybe there's people who need to hear the gospel that you know of that you can send to here. But um, we're glad to be here this morning and um, glad to share with you this morning from what's on my heart, what the Lord's put in front of us. Uh, to some extent, it may be challenging. Uh, it may be depressing. It may seem at times, but I hold... I encourage you to hold out to the end for the hope that comes in the truth. Anything that I say that it's not, I ask you to discard it and throw it away just like a judge would at, in a court. Strike that from the record and tell the jury they don't need to listen to that. But what I say, and if your spirit testifies that it's the truth from God and it's a word, I pray that you would not abandon it, but it would become part of you in your hearts. Before I begin, let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord God, that we have this opportunity to look into your face, to gaze upon you and your truth. Oh God, you are truth, and you are alive. The one true living God, who's revealed to us your presence through creation itself and through this beautiful thing called the Holy Scriptures that you've given us. I pray, Lord God, that you would speak to us today and teach us, instruct us, May every word that comes out of my mouth be handed to me from you, Lord God, and nothing else. Empty me of all my flesh, Lord God. Fill me with your spirit and empower me now to speak. And I pray, God, that you would fill these folks with your power and your spirit to receive that which you have for them, even if it may be difficult. But let us follow the truth. Let us follow you in love. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> it was in 2008 that we began serving with the Wisconsin Family Council. We got the opportunity to travel around the state and um, meet many people, and around the country really, and meet many people in the re marriage renewal effort. And it was kind of a fast-track learning opportunity for me through that process because I was just deluged with statistics, stats and numbers, and um, things like marriage rates and juvenile detention rates and uh, teen pregnancy rates and cohabitation rates and on and on and on. And it was very uh, engaging for me. I'm a numbers guy anyway by kind of nature. And uh, it was interesting because within the church and outside of the church, both agreed that there was nothing like marriage. No other relationship like marriage compared, or nothing else compared like marriage did. It was the best relationship for men and women to have. All others fell so far short that it was easy for me to travel around the state to churches like yours and other places and to preach and teach about the truth about marriage. The numbers supported it. It was an easy sell, if you will. Pastors and churches and congregations and individuals that I spoke to over and over, blown away by the numbers like I was, and easily became convinced. Because you know something, folks? Here's the truth about it. The evangelical church has let go of marriage in America. And as I went around preaching and teaching to grab hold of marriage again, it was an easy sell. Well, one day I uh, was reading an article about a marriage champion who I don't know personally, but I know of. And he was interviewed um, on a TV. This is an article about the interview. And the interviewer said to him, what is the problem with homosexual marriage, really? I mean, after all, if two people love each other, what does that hurt you in your marriage or anybody else's? And the man went on to uh, give a textbook answer. I listened to him give the textbook answer, and I was like applauding him by heart, like, 
Yeah, that's it. Exactly. He nailed it on the head about how devastating it is to our society, something like homosexual marriage. And in that moment, as he was doing that, as they thought about that and walked away from that and thought, yes, that's exactly it. He, he articulated it so well. In fact, I thought to myself, I couldn't even articulate it that well. And I thought, but a thought occurred to me. God pricked me. God moved me for a moment to think of something. He said, Eric, what happens when the statistics no longer support your truth? What happens when the statistics no longer support your truth? In other words, today, I know this. Children are better off living in a home with their biological mother and father than any place else. They do better in school. They stay out of jail. They get out of drugs. They don't get into pregnancy. Everything else. But what happens if somebody comes up and sit with a statistic? Or what if the stats start to come in overwhelmingly that show homosexual marriage produces better children? They're happier. They're healthier. They do better in school. They're better workers. What happens when you find out that nasty, rotten marriages are better off divorced than people move on and find happier places. What happens when we find out that, you know, really teen pregnancy isn't a bad thing after all? Having more children is a good thing. What happens then? Does truth change? I was challenged. Do you know, there's something that we call morals. <clears throat> More, morals. Good morals. We look at being moral. Well, morals are uh, uh, R.C. Sproul uh, defined uh, morals and ethics in the Truth Project, and he said, uh, morals are more, it comes from more, the what is. In other words, do you know that today that most Americans today, voting Americans today, believe that abortion is wrong? It's morally wrong. In other words, over 50, can you imagine, over 50% of voters in America believe abortion is wrong. We still have it in America today. But it's morally wrong. What about ethics? Ethics is the ought to be. Morals is the what is. Ethics is the ought to be. The only way to know what ought to be is what? You have to look at the foundation of your truth. Oh, Christian, your foundation and my foundation is what? God. So I look at God for truth because God said in his word, he said what? God is truth. The what ought to be is what God says and what God is. And guess what God says? No matter what the statistics show, whoo, and the lights just went on. <laughs> no matter what the statistics show, no matter what is in the society, no matter what we think is good, God says fornication, that is sex before marriage, is a sin. God says homosexuality is a sin. I didn't say it. God says divorce is a sin. I didn't say it. God says it. I can repeat what God says, but he said it. That's what ought to be. <clears throat> Why do I tell you this little story? A short time ago, the Supreme Court ruled and put forth a rule that becomes law in our land. I'm sure you're familiar with the, with the uh, ruling that they had and what now is a new law of the land. It's a decision that is an incredible decision, and it, it probably frustrates many of you or angers many of you or bothers or troubles many of you like it does me. A decision which uh, will not lead to more righteousness, holy living in, in America. A decision which won't uh, uh, guide us to a more higher state. A decision actually which we don't even know the true consequences of it today. Unless you're a philosopher or you're a prophet, we don't even know what it will lead to in the future. A decision that Im dramatically impacts individuals, program churches, um, and a free expression religion in this country, really, and will in and to the future. It will have a dramatic impact. We can't even envision the extent of it. You know, a little decision in the 1990, 1970s led to over 50 million children being murdered at the hands of abortionists. So 50 million children have been murdered since that time. Children, dead in the womb, killed in the womb. They are actually beings. You know, it's always hard for me to celebrate a birthday. <laughs> I mean, it'd be kind of weird to celebrate a con, what, 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 conceiving day. But the reality is, guess what? These are God's creation from the day of conception. And we've killed over 50 million of them. This is 50 million people that will never grow and ride a bike. 
Never swim in a swimming pool. Never throw a ball. Never grow to be adults. Never be a doctor, a lawyer, a soldier, a mother, a father, a pastor. 50 million people who won't invent new things. And won't advance the society if you want to look at it totalitarian, you know. Um, utilitarian, thank you, son. There's some 300 million people in America. That's one-sixth of our population. Gone because of nine guys in, in robes and one decision. Staggering. And what will happen to the decision they made just a couple weeks ago? Those same nine robes, those same nine people. How in the world do we deal with these issues? How in the world do we deal with as Christians these things? How do we talk about them? How do we react to them? How will you react to them? Well, I used to react to them as many Christians do. We need to counter moral decline with what? Moral living. That's really how I dealt with them. We need to decline, deal with the moral decline in our country with moral living. We need to educate and equip Christians to put forth the truth that traditional marriage is good and everything else is bad. We need to hold up doctrine, the Christian doctrine and the morals that go with it in our society. But is that the solution? Is that really the solution? Will it solve the moral decline? If we hold on to these morals, if we just keep our nation from slipping into more Sodom and Gomorrah-like activity, is that the answer? Listen, I worked in an organization that fought for traditional marriage across the state and with uh, entities across the country. We fought to keep it in the marketplace of ideas and fought uh, to make it the mainstay. I've fought for marriage for a long time because I believe that marriage is a reflection of God's marriage to His bride, the church. There's nothing like it. In fact, the more that I got called into marriage ministry, I was so excited about it. I felt sorry for every other ministry <laughs> because there's nothing like marriage in the Bible. I mean, look, I know that we're supposed to minister to the widows and orphans, but that's like one or a couple scriptures. We, God didn't use the orphans as an example of his relationship to you and me. He used marriage. Marriage is this unique thing, this wonderful thing. And what a joy that I had to, and still have, to minister to marriages. To be joined in this thing that like nothing else is talked about in this Bible. It's amazing. However, the Supreme Court's decision that homosexuals have a constitutional right to marry. You know something? It's not really an attack on marriage after all. No. It isn't about homosexual rights even. It isn't, a moral, it isn't an issue of moral decline. Honestly, it's an attack on God. All those folks involved in bringing about more moral decline are nothing but pawns. Pawns. Pawns in the hands of Satan. Satan doesn't hate marriage. Satan hates God, and marriage comes from God. Satan hates God and hates man. You know, you've probably heard of the online encyclopedia called Wikipedia. I don't know um, if you've heard of Conservapedia. Anybody heard of Conservapedia? Even our home, oh, they was, it's interesting. Here's what they say about Conservapedia. It's a clean and concise resource for those seeking truth. We do not allow liberal bias to deceive our, and distort here. Founded initially in November 2006 as a way to educate and advance college-bound homeschoolers, this resource has grown into a marvelous source of information for students, adults, and teachers alike. Listen to what Conservapedia has to say about moral decline. I was glad to have found this resource. I sometimes cite Wikipedia, and it's kind of like through my teeth. I'm like, you really got to work at checking it. Moral decline according to Conservapedia. In the Bible, moral decline was always a result of spiritual declension, declension, declension. A result of spiritual declension. That of falling into idolatry. The worship of false gods. Evidenced in the Bible. In addition to the transitory and finite nature of such created gods, these are seen to be forbidden due 
to their being the product of man's corrupt nature. Man also tends to become more like the object of his highest devotion and allegiance. Moral decline is a result of falling into idolatry, according to Conservapedia. What is the core of the problem that we have? Is the core of the problem that men are marrying men, women are marrying men? Is the core of the problem that we are killing babies in the womb? Is the core of the problem that the Bible has been taken out of the schools, children can't pray? Is the core of the problem porn is everywhere, our cities have so-called adult stores, strip clubs, drugs everywhere? No. No. Folks, I don't think so. I think Conservapedia has it right. The core of the problem is putting anything before God in idolatry. If you'd like to turn with me, you can turn to 1 Corinthians 10. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 10. This is not a new story, folks. <laughs> We've been reading as a family. Part of our daily reading plan has been in Ecclesiastes some. And uh, nothing's new under the sun. You're the wisest man in the world. Nothing's new under the sun. Folks, nothing is new under the sun. Nine guys in robes in Washington, D.C. making a decision about homosexuality. Nothing's new under the sun. This is an old story that's been played out. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 10, starting at verse 4, a story about the children of Israel. Story, an account about the children of Israel. Verse 4, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as an examples for us. Hold on to that. Examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality. <clears throat> this is talking about the children of Israel, but as the writer here says, it's an example for us. An example of what? An example of immoral living? No. An example of idolatry, the writer says. Idolatry that led to immoral living. Just a little bit further down, it says in verse 14, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. He doesn't say flee from immoral living. He doesn't say flee from sexual immorality, although there are other places in Scripture that does say that. But he says, my beloved, flee from idolatry. You're familiar with John 3.16? I, 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 I praise God this morning because in one of the songs we sang, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. It was interesting. I uh, was at my aunt's funeral here recently and a pastor was preaching at the funeral. Um, it was in a church that I was surprised to hear as much Scripture read as it was. I was, I was praising God for that. He was actually reading Scripture. He went on to say, you know, we kind of stop at that verse. We should have read verse 17. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Praise be to God. I wanted to say after he was done, you didn't stop, or you shouldn't have stopped, because you should have read verse 18. Verse 18 said, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Jesus does not condemn, but guess what? Condemnation has come, because if you continue on, verse 19, and this is the judgment, the light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. Another translation that says, this is a condemnation. Because we chose evil, we are condemned. Sin condemns us. Idolatry is choosing darkness over light. Worshipping that. Choosing evil, looking at evil and putting it before God. We don't have a moral decline problem in America. In verse 20, of that same book, John chapter 3, For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. 
But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Turn to Romans 1, if you will, please. Romans 1 and uh, verse 18. Why do we hate the light when we do evil or sin? Because the light exposes, it just said, those works. I love this chapter of Romans. It is so illuminating. It is so revealing. It puts it right where it is. And I love how it starts, actually. I'm going to start at 18, but I want to back up to 16 first. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. I don't know about you guys, but I have been ashamed of many things in my life. I can look back over my life and say, I've been ashamed of many things. And if you want after service, I'll tell you what they are. And I'm sure that you've been ashamed of a few things in your life too. But Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And I think it's a marker to the beginning of this, of this, this uh, sermon he's going to give here, if you will. I am not ashamed of the gospel. And he's going to go on and talk about shameful things. Why? Because when the darkness, when we want the darkness, we don't want the light because it shines on and, it, and we, are we, are, we are ashamed. 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give him thanks. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women who were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. All kinds. But it says God gave them up to these things. Because of what? They traded the truth for a lie. They worshiped the created rather than creator. Idolatry. These things he did not say are the problem. These are the result. We do not have a moral declination problem in this country. We have an idolatry problem. So if idolatry is a problem, will moral living fix it? You can turn to Matthew 23, if you will, please. <clears throat> Matthew 23, we're going to read verse, starting at verse 25. Matthew 23, verse 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Will moral living fix the problem? No. If 
It will clean the outside of the cup. We've been trying to clean the outside of the cup, folks. We've been trying to convince the unsaved that if they would just clean the outside of the cup, we'll have a good nation. Stay married to your wife. Don't have an abortion. Clean the outside of the cup. It's wrong to look at pornography. and Clean the outside of the cup. It's wrong to steal. Clean the outside of the cup. Our nation needs to come back to God. Clean the outside of the cup. We need Bible back in school. Clean the outside of the cup. We need to pray in school. Clean the outside of the cup. Let's live morally. Let's live righteously. Then God will honor us, right? Remember that verse that is often quoted, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, then I will hear from heaven. Does this prophet talk about cleaning the outside of the cup? I think not. What are we truly seeking? Do we want peace and prosperity, food on our tables, money in our bank accounts, cars to drive? Do we want a moral society? Because it, if it falls into debauchery, it will be a big problem for our finances or the life around us. That is what I believe Jesus talked about when in Mark 4 he noted certain seeds being choked out by the cares of the world. You don't have to turn there, but Mark 4.19 says, But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of the riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. The cares of the world choke the word. You know our country is rotting from the inside out. And we worry about how to stop the rot. We are worried about the world. Forgive me for this statement I'm going to make. We're worried about abortions. We're worried about divorces homosexuals in jail and money, and the word is choked out. Why are we trying so desperately to save something that is passing away? My son gave me that. Why are we worried so much about saving something that is passing away? Matthew 16, 26 says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? When we clean up, our acts, so to speak, with moral living, we actually end up in a worse place. You might be familiar with the, uh, uh, the parable that Jesus told from Matthew 12, 43 and 45 when he said, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless place, seeking rest, but it finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that person is worse than the first. So also will it be with this evil generation. Folks, we can't clean the outside of the cup. I was talking to an alcoholic recently, and he was telling me about he's going to quit, out, quit alcohol. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. I was helping him. As he's talking, I'm thinking about this verse. And I took him to this verse. And I said, you know, you can get rid of alcohol, and you can clean your house, and guess what's going to happen? You're going to have an empty house waiting for evil spirits to come back in. Because alcohol is idolatry too, and it's an evil spirit. And once it's driven from the house, if that's all you've done is clean the outside of the cup, you're going to be a problem waiting to happen. That's what this verse says. And if we try and do that in this country, it's a problem waiting to happen, folks. We can try to get rid of all the homosexual marriages we want. And at the end of the day, we have a clean cup and it's ready for more evil to come in. And I believe we've been doing that for decades. If we've been doing anything at all. The right reaction zeroes in on the heart of the problem, I believe. Psalm 115 begins with, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to you. To your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. 20, Psalm 24, The earth is the Lord's. And the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. Psalm 9, the Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. The wicked are ensnared in the work of their own hands. Now the right reaction to this, I don't believe, is more moral living. But looking at uh, Mark chapter 16 again, in verses 15 and 16. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Condemned. What did we find earlier in John 3? And this is the judgment, or the condemnation. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because of their works were evil. But not so to those who the gospel is proclaimed, who believe and are saved. 
they will be saved and will not be condemned. The right reaction to moral decline is to preach the gospel. Jesus Christ did not go into the world, did not say go into the world and preach moral living. He said go into all the world and preach the gospel. The only solution to the problem of all is a transformation of the heart. You cannot transform the outside of the cup. We can't fix moral decline with moral living. It won't work. It will work for a while, and we can act good, and we can follow laws and rules. The children of Israel tried that. Remember, they were given as an example for us. The law brings death, but the Spirit brings life. I don't want to bring more law to this world. I want to bring life to this world. The Spirit brings life. It is the heart of man that is desperately wicked. A moral living is a symptom. The cause is a wicked heart. All who believe in this gathering today have been there. If you're a believer, you have been there. What is there? A dirty cup. We had a dark and wicked, hardened hearts. The power of God and His gospel transformed our hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. Our hearts have been transformed and our lives were transformed, I trust, with it. Clean the inside of the cup and the outside of the cup will follow. As it says in Proverbs 4.23, from the, the heart is the wellspring of life. You know, it is troubling when the Supreme Court makes these kind of decisions. I understand. It's not that I'm not troubled about it. It's hurtful. It's frustrating. We'll soon elect another leader in our land, and who knows if he will or she will be more debased and immoral than the last. Who knows if he or she will lead our nation into further debauchery. Folks, we will likely go there. God has already told us this story. The future of the sin-sick world is not good because it's a godless place. We won't be able to make it more moral. We can lament about it and be saddened about it all we want. We can fight against it. We can, we can elect another representative. We can march in Washington all we want. But it will not clean the inside of the cup. This may all sound somber and hopeless and depressing. And guess what? If we only look out at the world today, that's what it is. There's nothing in the world, nothing but death. But this is not where it ends for me. No. This is not where it ends for you either, O oh man of God or woman of God. It is not the end. It is not a world of decline in my mind. It's not a loss in my mind. Why? Well, here's just one hopeful statement by our Lord. From John 14, He says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in Me. An old friend of mine, Jim Gribbs, said once, We take the Bible as if it were a set of suggestions instead of a book of commands. I know the law brings death. The Spirit brings life. But he also said, your commands are not burdensome, some burden, burden, burden. <laughs> They're not a burden. His commands are not a burden anymore to me. Let not your hearts be troubled. Jesus Christ, O Christian, commands you, let not your hearts be troubled. Jane and I get to work with a lot of people with troubled hearts. They have a lot of pain. Those suffering in marriage pain, those suffering in relationship pain of many kinds. Those are real pains, real hurts. We forget ourselves, though, at times. and We look not to Jesus Christ, not to God. And we let our hearts be troubled. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in Me. Wow. Some of you may be troubled this morning. I don't know with what. Jesus said, you don't believe in Me, really, if you are too long. I understand that. That... We've had temporary amnesia. We're temporarily insane. Insanity, I don't remember exactly how that definition goes, but basically it's believing in an alternate truth, I think, from what would be the concept of reality. Since God is truth, it would be you're believing in something else besides God. And I have been there myself. I understand if you're there. It hurts. But he said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. 
This is a broken world. Jesus came into a broken world and gave hope to it. And then he sends us to do what? What did we just read? And we didn't read it because I didn't read it. Sorry. <laughs> what did Jesus say? And we're going to talk about it in a minute more. Go and preach the gospel. That's what he said. The hope in the world is to preach the gospel. Proclaiming it. You know, there's joy in my heart because in 1997, August of 1997, somebody preached the gospel to me. There's hope in my heart because before that, I was just a moral man. I don't know about you, but, but I've grown up going to church. I've grown up going to church. I didn't go to a Bible-believing church, but I went to church. And when I became an adult and sat there with my beautiful wife and my uh, three lovely children in the front of the church, and I would sit there Sunday after Sunday and I would pray, God, make me a better man. Make me a better man. And yet, I knew he didn't. It didn't work. God, clean the outside of my cup. Please. And it didn't work. He didn't clean the outside of my cup. In August of 1997, I finally came smack dab. I knew it all, I learned it all along. I had believing friends. And they would talk to me about being born again and being saved. And it would agitate me. And honestly, inside, it scared me. It scared me. Because I knew this God wanted all of my life. But yet I was blinded because I thought, I'm a good man. I'm in church. I want to know about this God. I do want to go to heaven. I believe I'm going to heaven because of Jesus Christ. And yet I was blinded because I had a veil over my heart, as it says in Corinthians. Now I'm filled with joy because in August of 1997, he took the blinders off my eyes. He tore open the veil and I fell straight into him. And I've never been the same since. My life was transformed then. It wasn't perfect. It's not perfect today. My wife will testify. But praise be to God that Jesus Christ is my Savior. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And I do. I walk in this world as you do, but I'm not of this world. I'm in this world, but I'm not of it. And I walk with joy in my heart, not because the world is getting better. In fact, as the world gets worse, it says, gee, this book is right. I don't remember it saying in here, oh, it's going to get all better out there, and then I'll come. Actually, I think it says, it's going to get a whole lot worse, and then I'll come. But I choose to walk in this world under the commands of God, like Philippians 4 says. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And as I look at that list, do you know the only thing that meets that list is Jesus Christ and the Father that sent Him and the Holy Spirit that dwells in me now. The love of God dwells in you if you're saved. I walk around thinking those thoughts, those good thoughts, not because I'm hopeful for a new fishing boat, or not because I'm hopeful for my bank account to increase, not because I'm hopeful that my kids won't be on drugs, not because I'm hopeful that my marriage will stay together, because God is honorable, and He's just, and He's pure, and He's lovely, and He's commendable, and He's excellent. And He's worthy of praise. Worship. worth -ship. He's worth praising. Think about these things. I don't tie my hope up in Barack Obama or the guy that's going to outseat him. <laughs> you know, my prayer is that somebody hears Jesus Christ through me. 
I sow, you water, and God gives the increase. I have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. He's given me this and this for now. That's all I have. A friend of mine recently ranted about how messed up this world is. He went on and on for five minutes about how goofed up the government is, how goofed up businesses are, even how goofed up Christians are, how goofed up the world is around. He said, God owes Sodom and Gomorrah apology. I was like, brother, whoa, careful. And then he said, who's going to rise up to fix it? And get a hold of this. I said, you know something? In my mind, I said, you know something? I can't change the world, but I can change this man sitting in front of me. I can't change the world. I'm not going to be Billy Graham. I don't want to be Billy Graham. But I know God put that man in front of me. And I might be able to change his little world because I can speak Christ into him. I can tell him that in August of 1997, Jesus Christ saw fit to die on the cross. I finally recognized, because God opened my blinded eyes and tore open the veil, that Jesus Christ died for my sins and he wanted to transform my life. And I fell into his arms and I've never been the same since. And he wants to do that for that man or the man or woman standing in front of you. We run around too often saying, who's going to reach the lost? Someone ought to disciple them. Someone ought to reach them. And all the time, God is putting somebody right in your path. Where am I to do ministry? They're right in front of you. They're right in front of me. Recently, we had an elderly woman that um, uh, we got connected with. And she needed a roof on her house. And I started calling some of my brothers up to put a roof on her house and help out and gather up some guys to put in some money to pay for it and that sort of thing. And, uh, and like I got this like limited response from healthy guys. I mean, guys who could crawl on. I'm 50. I shouldn't be on a roof. Should I? I, mean, I might fall off. <laughs> and I'm calling around trying to get, and, and I'm getting limited, no response. And God spoke to me. He said, Eric. And, and you know, I mean, God, by the way, most people reckon, I don't really have a job. <laughs> I don't have a real job. I, I go where God has me all the time. So I'm, you know, and so these other guys, they got jobs, they got to work, and they got families and that sort of thing. And God spoke to me, he said, Eric, do you know how to put a roof on? Yeah, yeah, I got it. I know how to put a roof on. Good, okay. Eric, do you have the time to put a roof on? Yeah, I got the time to put a roof on. Eric, do you have the resources to put the roof on? Yeah. Why don't you put the roof on, Eric? And I realized that, you know something, that was a moment. Because you know something, God is putting people in front of me. I'm not worried about who he's put in front of you, and I'm going to stop worrying about if you're going to help me with my guy or my gal. But he's put somebody in my place. I don't know if I can change the whole world, but I might be able to change her little world right then. You and I will not make this a more moral country. We can't find a way to clean the outside of the cup. But there's somebody in front of you, I'll guarantee you, God is going to put them in. And I trust right now, God, I pray that you will put somebody in front of their path that there isn't anybody there and open up their eyes to see them, that they're in front of you. And it's that cup of coffee, or it's that sandwich, or that salad, or that helping hand on somebody's deck or roof or whatnot. And you can stand before them, and you can proclaim the most important thing you can do. Do you know something we're... We're doing these gospel meetings coming up, and one thing that came to us, I believe, through the Spirit of God, was that I, I have invited people to countless church activities over the years. Hundreds, maybe thousands of church activities, and maybe you have too. And I don't know about you, but every single one of them is the same thing. It's kind of like I've got with me today. I've got this little card about this gospel meeting. Hey, I'd really like you to come to this gospel meeting. It's going to be great. It's going to be fun. The speaker's fantastic. And uh, you got to hear them, um, and it could change your life. You know, just think about it. Make sure you come. You know, write it on your calendar. Here you go. How many times I've done that? Do you know something? The Spirit of God fell upon us and said no. How did the woman at the well invite them to the event? 
Come and see the man who told me everything about my life. The whole place cleared out. I mean, I don't think she was some great speaker or some great marketing or salesperson. She was getting water. Come and see the man. When is the last time that I have shared my testimony like that? And I say to my own shame, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Well, I don't know that I've gone and spoke that to many people. But do you know something? My life changed in August of 97. It is incredible what God did. I've never been the same. Never. I want you to come in here. Are you down? Are you, I mean, are you saying, oh, the burdens of life just too much to bear? Have you tried for too long? Have you tried for too long to get out of it? Is it a bad marriage? Is it a bad job? Is it a bad life? Is your money a wreck? I don't know what it is for you. Is the burden of sin so sick? Are you so tired of being an alcoholic and throwing up one more time? What is it? Come and hear the God. I know that place. I was there. I want you to come and hear the God. Tell me. I say, I have not done that. But I will do that now. We cannot clean the outside of the cup, folks, but you know something? We can invite people to come, and God will clean the cup, and He will fill the cup with the Holy Spirit. And I know what that is like myself. And I can tell somebody, you want that. And by the way, after that, I stopped drinking. And after that, I stopped swearing. Full disclosure, my sons will admit, once in a while I slip. But you know something? The morality of my life, <laughs> you know, I'm getting closer to God. And the more of Christ that is in me and of me, the less of the world and those other things. But I didn't get saved by doing that. I was saved and that follows. Because why would I want that other junk? I want Christ. And I want to preach Him crucified. Oh, man of God and woman of God, there is hope in this world. It is to look up. It is to see. You know, my wife recently made a statement. We were, we were actually back from a meeting talking about these gospel meetings. And because I, we think a lot about marriage and so forth, she said, <clears throat> um, she said, uh, my marriage... Uh, was rotten, essentially. God changed my marriage because He changed me. That is Jane speaking. And He changed my marriage, Eric speaking, because He changed Eric. He changed, if you're saved, let me ask you this, if you're saved, did He change the world around you? Did He make your friends better? Did He make your boss better? Did He make your money better? No. He changed the world around you because He changed you. That's the inside of the cup. I can't tell you how many desperate, hurting people are looking to get fixed out there. Their marriage sucks. Their husband is a problem. And if their husband gets fixed, problem solved. After this meeting today, we're going to actually have a meeting with a woman on our way home. And she's going to tell us why she's filed for divorce. And how wrong, I guarantee you, I will listen for a half an hour and she will go on and on and on. I guarantee you, most of the conversation for the first half an hour will be what he's doing wrong. You know why I know that? Because I've listened to hundreds of them. And it's the same story. And it's your story too sometimes and it's my story. What's wrong? They are. Jesus Christ says, what's wrong? I am. And the only way, Eric, you're going to fix them is to fix you. And I'll guarantee you, folks, the only way to fix you or to fix your little world is to fix you and your heart if God hasn't saved it. And the only way to fix this great country of ours is to fix the hearts of men and women and to fill them with the Holy Spirit and empower them and to recognize that they are saved from their sins and transform them into new creatures. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, I thank You, Lord God, that You saw fit. Oh, You saw fit in Your mercy and grace that You would come and even save such a sinner as I. And the dear brothers and sisters in this room who You've come to save. Oh God, I pray for the one who may be hearing this morning, who may be listening, and they know I know what they, is going on in their head because I was there. It's their little secret. And it's okay, God. You know it too. Nothing is secret from you, God. And they're scared like I was. Oh, God, take the blinders off their eyes, I pray. Rip open the veil that covers their heart and let them dive into you. Save them this day, O oh Lord. And may they call upon your name and repent of their sins and come to you and be transformed, and live life anew. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, amen.